Hello and welcome back to the Terrace Life podcast and today we've brought you a bonus episode, an episode I'm uh, very honoured to uh, host. Uh, we welcome to the podcast uh, a man who's won, not only won, but captained a team to an FA Cup final victory. He's made numerous uh, Premier League appearances, he's featured in the Europa League and featured on the international uh, stage and he's also now in the process of setting up his own academy. Uh, welcome to the podcast. Luton, Wigan and Crystal Palace, a uh, hero and legend, Emerson Boyce. Hey, Dean, thanks for having me and yeah, I look forward to it today. <laughs> no, it's good, it's good to have you, mate. Obviously, we have to address the, um, address the elephant in the room in terms of uh, lockdown. So how's lockdown been for you, uh, all these, uh, lo- what feels like a very long eight weeks? Yeah, it's not been too bad, to be honest. Um, I've just been doing loads of courses, uh, done my governancy course, my sports um, and marketing, and I've been spending loads of time with my kids. So... You know, you just got to make, make the best of it. Um, yeah, and obviously follow the government guidelines and unlike everybody else, just waiting to see what's going to happen, you know, in a couple of weeks' time. So apart from that, um, yeah, just looking out the window, watching people walk by. <laughs> yeah, I, I mean, I've, I've spoken a few of our different podcasts about it's a good opportunity for a bit of, like, personal growth, but spend some time with your family. We live hectic lives, don't we, where we're buzzing around to work and, you know, we're busy. Um it's, it's kind of good just to spend some time with your family. I mean, it might be a bit different for those people who are locked down alone. Um, but certainly for me, a bit of personal growth, getting to do interviews like this with people like yourself, and spending a bit of time with my family as well, it's been, been yeah, I think, right. you know, I think this is where, you know, obviously, you know, everyone's circumstances are different, but, you know, you appreciate the smaller things, you know, and we're going, you know, looking at, you know, spending time with our kids. Um, out of all this, the, the simplest thing is to wash our hands. <laughs> You know, when it actually boils down to it, the simple hygiene that we should take, you know, we take for granted is actually the main, you know, part of um, keeping safe. So, you know, it's a bit of a re-education for all of us and, you know, we've just got to keep it going, you know, even when this is over. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, so, Emerson, to get on to your footballing career then, to take you right back to the very start, uh, when did football sort of start for you? What's your first memories of playing football? Um, I was 10 years old when I first started, so... You know, in this day and age, it's, it's pretty late. Um, and I was, I was into cricket. My dad was um, from Barbados, so we had uh, West Indies. And you know, at the time, it was all about cricket, cricket, cricket. Um, I was, I was, wasn't too bad, to be fair. I was an all-rounder. Um, and then I went into athletics. Um, but I just found it too of a longer day. So my friend, uh, Andrew Wright, you know, he took me down to Ellsbury United. And the first training session... You know, I, I loved the goalkeeper, Nicky Hurd. I remember that. And the manager at the time, Steve Greenough, said, I don't, I don't know, what, I don't care about anything else, we're signing you today. <laughs> so that's how it's how it started. And, you know, and, you know, forever now, it's, you know, Steve Greenough, you know, I, I owe him a lot to my career. He's um, done so much in my career. Um, you know, taking me from when I was younger, taking me to all the games and cause my parents were working at the time. So, you know, for, for him, I owe my career. Yeah, so would you say he was probably your biggest influence in getting into the sport to start with then? Yeah, definitely. Um, you know, his coaching was all right. You know, obviously um, it was a grassroots football and, you know, he taught me a lot. Um, but it was just the other side of it where, you know, my, both my parents were working full time and I couldn't get to Luton. I couldn't get to the training. And he, you know, went out of his own way to make sure I got to training me and another boy, Nando Perna. And, um, you know, it's a, it was a case of, Without him, I probably wouldn't have had an opportunity to actually go and coach, uh, go and play football. So, you know, I still speak to him to this day. He's a great man. And, you know, for him, it was the um, biggest influence on my career, probably. Yeah, so um, how did um, how did you find your way to Luton then? Was it was, was you picked up playing for Aylesbury and then the, sort of the, the trial method that I know that a lot of the clubs use nowadays? Yeah, in them days, it was, it was called a school of excellence. So I was at Aylesbury United and... Um, a scout came down and asked if I can go to Luton. Um, again, Steve Greenhalf took me down on every Thursday, I think it was, to Milton Kings. And, you know, went to train. And, um, yeah, it went in from there. And then I remember my first game, you know, against, it was, I think we played Bedgrove or Mandeville or someone out. It was that actual Kenilworth Road. So, you know, they had me, you know, at Kenilworth Road and line up, there's a picture. And um, whoever, who would have thought in the future I would be actually be playing at that stadium. So, no, it was um for me. It was a uh, you know looking back at it now, it was a, a great start. <laughs> yeah, do, do you feel, do you feel Everson now because obviously you're getting into coaching and things like that? Do you feel 
that there's sometimes pressure on youngsters because I know certainly from my experience my son got picked up by Leeds United at the age of eight um, ironically in the first game he'd ever played competitively um, which is strange in itself but I remember when they released him after a, like eight week trial they released him to a, so, to a, a similar sort of um, sort of department of excellence if you like he went to like a a shadow squad um, and trained there for another 18 months but um, I had to sit him down very early on and explain to him that you know it's just a step on a journey it's just a, an opportunity for him to grow and get better at football and if it doesn't work out it's not such a big deal but I think even for him at the age of eight he felt a bit of pressure because he's a Leeds fan and he's got as, as most young boys he's got his heart set on being a footballer Do you feel there's quite a lot of pressure there on, on youngsters certainly nowadays this is side. This is the side that you know. Not I don't like, but it's a lot. A lot of coaches pick up as many kids as they can, and it's not always for the benefit of the kids. It's more for the benefit of themselves. And you know what the impact it can have on the kids, especially at a young age, being released. You know, some of them get released two, three times from a club by the time they're twelve years old. You know, and the impact on them is is massive, and. I get it. Everybody's trying to look for the next Wayne Rooney and the next young star coming up and next Rashford, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. But I feel like there's more to it than just um, the football, you know. And it's it's the, the growth of that young young star that's coming through. And I think the the ruthless side, because I know a few people whose whose kids have been on trials, it's the way they get let go. You know, it's not so much the the the, the time they're playing, they're training there, but it's the how they let them go, and they just literally just cut them off. And it's no, and it's not about how they feel afterwards. It's about you know, okay, you're not good enough. We don't need you no more. Bye bye. And I think that's the hardest lesson for a lot of the kids. And and I go from my own experience at, at, at an academy. You know, we got um, we had to let kids go between November and December. And at 16 years old, you know, they're going through their the hormones. They're going through the exams. They're going through life changes in a whole, and then on that added pressure of having to try and get a contract at a, a professional club is massive. And we're talking about the birth years now. You know, I've got, I've got my, one of my sons born in April, the other one's born in August. So I'm looking at that thinking, you make a decision in December and my son's still almost, what, almost a year. <laughs> you know, so it's, um, you know, for me, I was lucky. I'm a, I'm a September birthday. So... Mm -hmm. You're looking at birth years, I was bigger than everybody else, so that probably you know works in my favor. But I think it's very you know, a lot of people develop lately, um, you know, different times, yeah, absolutely. Again, going back to my son, he, he's a March baby, so yeah, mm. he's you know, he's, he's in a similar boat. But again, myself, I was an October, an mm. October kid, so I was one of the bigger kids in the class and stuff, and he is one of the smaller kids in the class. It's, it's uh, it's absolutely crazy. But uh, back onto your career, then Emerson, obviously, uh, breaking through at Luton, um. What sort of what what was that like as an experience? Because it's every kid's dream. It certainly was my my dream to to play professional football. Um, I never never got to realise it. You did. Um, you know, as as an experience, you know, playing at Kenilworth Road in front of Luton fans as a as essentially still a young man. What what was that like? Yeah, well, it almost didn't happen. Um, you know, when I was sixteen, I thought I was getting being released. Um, you know, everyone else got their contracts about two weeks before me. Um, and at the time, there was no talk or no nothing. So I'm scratching my head now. And this is why I always, you know, every youngster I tell you, education is important. Because, you know, when I was um, 16, I was looking around thinking, what am I going to do with myself? Because I didn't do very well in school. And um, at 16, I was, I was more or less going to get released. I don't know if uh, uh, another player went off or they changed their mind or whatever. But I was very, very lucky. And then it just snowballed from there. The first year, I didn't really play. Um, I was in a good um, FA Youth, um, a good Luton youth team where we went on to the FA Youth Cup semi final. Uh, we had Matty Upson, Matt Taylor, Gary Doherty, a lot of players that went on and played in the Premier League. So, um, my first experience with Kenilworth Road was, I think it was uh, uh, against Kidderminster Town, I think it was, in the FA Cup. Um, the managers put me in the squad. I wasn't expected to play at all. And then next to you know, he chucked me in, played wing back. And it was the best feeling of, of you know, the best feeling ever because. There's no pressure whatsoever. Just go out and play. And the Luton Stadium is so tight and the fans are so, so there. It's, um yeah, it gave me a massive, massive buzz. 
Just just focusing on Luton a little bit then. Uh, what league were they in then? League two? League one? It'll be in League uh I'm trying to think now. League it'll be League One. I think they'll be in League One now, how it is now. Structured. So division I think it'll be in division two at the time. Yeah. So in League One, yeah. Do you think that gave you a good ground in them, that level of football? Because I think looking now from the Premier League down to say League Two, the the difference in football is mm. is is almost sort of night and day with with the way you look where the games approached um and i certainly know from experience of the team i i um i follow that sometimes you can't get yourselves out of them lower divisions by trying to play nice football you have to find another way yeah 100 percent. you know i take that you know from league what i played in league one and league two so it was all about elbows and fighting and, and putting your head where it hurts and you know you know as a youngster i was a striker so i didn't like heading the ball i didn't like tackling and, you know, Steve Greenough put me as a defender. And, and then I say, you know, I remember playing against Steve Howard, who was uh, at Nor Northampton at the time. And the ball went up and the first swing he'd done was elbowing me right in the face. <laughs> you know, and that was like a wake-up call saying, hold on, is it not about playing football here? It's about, you know, fighting and, and not fighting, but sticking up for yourself and, you know, going into battle. And, you know, throughout my, when I got into the Premier League now, I use that experience of playing in lower division to help me through those certain circumstances in the in the in the Premier League, and you know that, that helped me massively. Yeah, absolutely. So after, cut, after cutting your teeth at Luton, then um, you got a, a move to Palace. Uh, I'm, I'm led to believe it was via a trial. So you went you went on trial at Palace first. I mean, we we hear about these trials for youngsters, <laughs> and we hear about these trials for pros. I mean, what's what's a trial like? Well, I didn't know I was on a trial. <laughs> yeah, if I knew, I probably would have took the experience in more. Um, yeah. What happened was, I thought I was going to sign for Crystal Palace. Um, they just got into the Premier League. Um, the the indication was I was going to sign. I left Luton on the, you know, I won a couple of trophies at Luton. And I will end up at going to Crystal Palace. And, and I was there for one day, two days, three days. And they kept saying, you're going to sign tomorrow, tomorrow, tomorrow. And I'm sitting in the canteen now, eating my, eating my lunch. And it came up on Sky Sports News, Emerson Boyce on trial at Crystal Palace. I've been there for two weeks. <laughs> <laughs> no, no one said anything to me. And, um, you know, I was lucky enough where Danny Butterfield was the right back at the time at Crystal Palace. Hadn't missed a game for about two years, player of the year. And a week before the season started, he'd done his hamstring. And that was probably the only reason why I got a contract at Crystal Palace because they didn't have another right back. And they gave me a contract on, I went on good money anyway, at, coming from League One. And they literally half my wages anyway. And I was like, what do I do? I can't go nowhere. You know, I'm play, basically playing in the Premier League on League One money. <laughs> and I'm like, well, do you know what? It's an opportunity you've got to take it with both hands and the rest is history. Yeah, absolutely. You went on to be an absolute stalwart at Palace. Um, and it, and the thing I noticed, Emerson, when I did um, a bit of research is every club you've been to, every single fan speaks absolutely glowingly as you as a, both as a pro and as a, um, and as a person. Uh, and you, you were named player of the year in 2006 at Palace. Um, like, you know, at, at that point, do you kind of take stock as a person and think, wow, I'm, I'm, I'm playing, you know, for Crystal Palace, who are, are a big club. Uh, no disrespect to Luton, um, you know, I'm winning, I'm winning player here. Do you, do you ever sit back and think, yeah, do you know what? I think I've got this football thing cracked. Um, no, do you know what? It was, it was John Moore at Luton. He always told me, you know, make sure you're humble, you know, and, and goes, you know, the matter what, you know, always, you remember football is a career where you go up, uh, but you'll drop down quickly. Uh, my parents always, you know, drilled it into me, you know, when you're at the top, remember, enjoy it. But remember, there's a long way coming down as well. When you're coming down, people, you know, remember them, them, them question days, um, answers that you used to give and how you are as a person. But a lot of it is your own personality. You know, I just believe in treating people how you want to be treated and give everything on the pitch. And, you know, when you're off the pitch, be as humble as you can. So, you know, that's the values I, I, I go by and, you know, to this day. Absolutely. Who, who were the gaffer at Palace? Were it uh, Ian Dowie then when he came in? Yeah, Ian Dowie. He, you know, you know, people ask who's my you know, best manager I've ever had. For me, it was Ian Dowie. You know, I had um, some great managers, you know, Steve Bruce, you know, Mark, Roberto Martinez, uh, Rosta. They all had their own thing. But Ian Dowie was the person who believed in me the most. You know, you know, technically I was not the best, 
you know, some people call me Bambi on ice when I was with the ball, you know. <laughs> but um, but he always drilled into me. As long as you give him 100%, you know, I was always back here and he just gave me the license to go out and play and, and uh, you know, I'll always be grateful for him. Yeah, obviously, coming from uh, experience of having so many managers, for you, Emerson, what, what type of manager did you like working for? Because I know I, I manage people for work now and some people need a bit of an arm round. Some people need a rocket up uh up their ass to get some out of them. You know, I, I, if you were to describe yourself as um, as a player or a manager that you felt you got got the best out of you, would you say it were Ian Dowie because he believed in you? Um, to a extent, uh, um, for me personally, I was a manager. I I was able to adapt. You know, throughout my career, um, someone said to me, you know, you know, best be, the best thing about me, I could adapt. You know, I had Joe Kinnear, who was very very old school. You know, and he used to hammer me every single game. You know, he used to hammer me. So I had that mental side of it where it was old school, you know, love, as they, as they, as they so called call it. And then Roberto Martinez was very quiet, very talkative, very, you know, you know what I mean? So they all managed to get something out of me in a different different way. Um, Ian Day was very back to motivation, you know, and that's, I, I, you know, I still believe in that today, of motivation and values. And, you know, that's what I took out of him. You know, regarding everything else. Yeah, do you know um, when we talk about you? Obviously, came up um, from Aylesbury to Luton, and I would imagine it was like a YTS scheme type type thing then. So, were you like cleaning pros' boots and stuff like that? Yeah, I had um, Steve Davies. Uh, he went on to play for Burnley. He was Luton captain at the time, um, and Darren Patterson. Gee, <laughs> I remember leaving some dirt on his a little speck of dirt on his boot, and he chased me around that training ground. <laughs> Because, you know, at that time, it was all about standards and, you know, they don't want to see a little speck of um, dirt on their boots because that's the standards they they wanted me to keep. And do you know what? I never, ever, you know, made sure his, dirt, his boot was ever dirty again because um, he wasn't a man to mess around with, put it that way. <laughs> do, do you think um, a little bit that side of the game is missing now? And that's possibly why some of the young players coming up really struggle with the transition from being a scholar to being a pro. Um, you know, because they haven't had that grounding. Uh, and then when, certainly I know, again, going back to, you know, the club I support, we've seen many youth players come into the first team and then just wilt under, under the pressure because they're not used to 40,000 fans getting on the case when they miss pace a pass. Do you think that that grounding you had of, you know, having standards, having boots to clean, getting stick if you'd not done them properly, mm. you know, getting stick for being a, a, a YTS lad or, or a scholar, do you think that gave you the grounding to be able to mentally handle the pressure later on in your career? I think society's changed anyway. You know, I think that's a major, major factor. You know, when I was growing up, you know, whether people, you know, turn up, turn up eyes to it or not, it's, you know, it was about tough love. You know, you know, you had to stand up and be, and stand up for yourself in any sort of change rooms and earn the respect of your older players. And that's through cleaning boots. That's through doing your jobs. Um, I used to sweep the tunnel at Ken Kenworth Road, you know, and it's all about doing the hard, no one say labour, but, doing all the hard work off the pitch as well as on the pitch. And you earn it more off the pitch than you do on the pitch. And for me, it was a privilege being in the first team change rooms, you know, and, and to look, look, look around the pros and seeing how they carried on. Well, this this day and age, you know, a lot of the youngsters just go into the change room and think it's nothing, you know. And, and it is, you know, I, you know, I was down here, you know, in, in playing at um, um, Esch, Esch, down here. And we had a lot of boys that dropped out from Man United, Man City. And they're only about seven, between 17 and 21. So we had me, Emil Heskey, Nathan, Alli Nathan Ellerton, and Dean Gore, Jay Lay Samuels before he passed away. And we used to have a kick around. And we had all these boys coming out of Man City, uh, Man City and Man United. And we used to say to them, why didn't go down and play for, you know, like at LG United or, or whatever. But because they're so used to being at that high standard at Man City and everything, and everything getting pampered for, that they're not used to going down to lower leagues and, and basically grafting away. And that's not all of them, but it's only some of them. But the stats are really high that they don't progress back into football once they get released from the bigger clubs. And this is, um, I think, society in general, you know, not that they're not as tough as we used to be, but we, we, we can deal with setbacks a bit more easier, I think. No, I think you're right. I had a little time coaching in non-league um, up here in Yorkshire, and we used to get lads who'd been released from you know, from league clubs who, you know, sort of finding their way down the football pyramid to, to sort of their level. 
And uh, we had like experience from lads who've been released two or three years to lads who've been released six months. And there was a marked difference between the lads who've been released two or three years and the lads who've just been released. Uh, they just weren't used to it at all being like that. Uh, like having to wash their own kit was a, a complete like, you know, surprise to them, if you like. And and, and a lot of them, um, or certainly from my experience, some of them just give up on the game and and, yeah. and because they couldn't adapt, couldn't take the sort of rejection, if that makes sense. And, and that's the hardest side of it is the, the rejection. So we're talking about kids that are from eight years, nine years, 10 years old getting rejected at that age. And it's a, a massive impact on the kids at 16, 17, 18, even more so, you know, because you're waiting for that next best move because you've been told that you're going to make it, you're the best player, you're, you know, football is still going to be your career. Then suddenly from eight years old to 16, you've been told, you, you know, we don't need you no more. So, you know, I found it very difficult coming out of football at, you know, 36, you know, as a grown man coming out of football. So imagine the youngsters coming out of football and, and the rejection, that side of it. So... I'm, good. I'm glad mental health is coming out at the moment because it's very open, but it is a lot of pressure to deal with. And, you know, one of my friends that um, I came up, came up in the ranks with about Els United, he got rejected by Arsenal. And he felt he found it very difficult to deal with rejection at the time. And he's, he's my age now, and he only dealt with it about two years ago. Yeah. <laughs> so it shows you how longevity it can have an effect on, on different people, you know? Yeah, I mean, we're in, we're in, we're jumping back and forth here, but um, just on the point you mentioned about um, leaving, um, I spent six years in the military before I'm in the job that I'm in now, and um, although it's not the same, it's very similar to football because it's very very um, all encompassing. You know, it is life. You live on camp. You know, everything. It's so um, it, it controls every aspect of your life, much like football does do for footballers. And I'll be honest, when I left, I found it really hard for about four or five months because I suddenly went from be belonging I was this and yeah. then I didn't belong to anything anymore and I, I spent a lot of time like trying to it's, it's a bit um it's a bit cheesy but trying to find myself and think well where yeah. do I fit back into society you know yeah. was that kind of your experience because I've heard a lot of ex-pros have you know the similar kind of discussion to that was that was that your experience when you did eventually decide to to sort of hang them up yeah you, you do feel lost because you know you're used to paying in front of you know, for me, you know, 40, 50, 60, 70,000 people, you know, going into training ground every single, uh, every single day from 16 years old to, to 36, you know, that was my structure. You know, I had someone doing, not doing something for me, but you always it's like being at school, you know, you knew what you're going to do every part of the day. You knew where you was going to go. Someone was telling you what you're going to, you know, how you're going to train, you know, your diet, everything. And suddenly when you come out of football now, you know, you're looking around, you're at home, you haven't got that dress, dressing room environment, uh, you haven't got the buzz of the, you know, a game on a Saturday. And a lot of the time your phone stops ringing, not because people don't want to know you, but because you're not used to, you know, socialising as not a, um, not a footballer. You know, and I went to, I went to counselling, you know, and the counsellor said to me, you know, when you're Emerson the footballer, you're okay. Now you're Emerson the person now you've got to find yourself. And it's as strange as it is, you know, it is to like two different people. You know, you work in person and then you actually, the person, you know, the, the only lifestyle. So it was a major shock for a lot of people. And I was very lucky, you know, my parents helped me through, um, former players. And we and it's become more of a, a talking point now where everybody else is, is willing to talk about mental health, which, you know, for me is fantastic. Yeah, absolutely. And again, I, I can't liken it to football, but I certainly can with the military. And the thing you mentioned there about the phone stopping ringing, that was the hardest bit I found because I'd been part of this big family for six years and we did everything together and we looked after each other and we looked out for each other. And it's very much like a team, uh, like a team sport. And then when I left, because you're out of sight and you're not in the, you know, the equivalent changing room every day and you're not, you're not part of it, the phone stops ringing. And I, I got to a point where I was like, well, you know, why is it, why is it stop ringing? Like, but like it took me a long time as I got a bit older and a bit more mature that I realised that just because you're not there anymore, you're just not front and centre anymore. It's not because they think any less of you. You're just you're just not there anymore. Now you got to put yourself in that situation, and that's the that's the biggest thing. Uh, the p biggest person probably helped me was Dave Whelan um, at Wigan. Um, he kept inviting me to the games. I wasn't going, and then one day I decided just to go down, and he put me straight into you know. He said, look. You know, I know I understand football's hard, you know, transition side of it. 
Um, come and have work experience at my my gym. Come and have work experience, you know, in around the football club. And he helped me quite a lot, you know, just purely being being able just to offer. There's nothing, you know, no payment, nothing like that, but just to get me out of the house. You know, mm. I was going through divorce at the time and, you know, all that sort of stuff. And that's what people don't realise, you know, you know, people come out of football or, or work or in a certain situation, people don't realise what's going on in the background in their actual life. And, you know, we look at the percentage wise, you know, it's like 60% get divorced in the first three years and the bankruptcy and, and all that. So we come out of football or, or certain jobs you suddenly got to learn social skills. You suddenly got to learn lifestyle and actually understanding the simple things that people take for granted that we had to basically redevelop ourselves. And that's what people don't always understand. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, that segues me on perfectly to our next talking point. So um, a move from Palace to Wigan. Um, so how did that come about? And I've got a couple of questions on transfer dealings as well, just because I'm interested. Um, do you know what? I was never, ever going to Wigan. Um, you know, I was, you know, down from down south, we used to look at the weather, raining, raining, <laughs> cold, raining. <laughs> we used to sat there, raining, cold. And um, it was at a time when um, Palace just missed out on going back to the Premier League. Uh, we got beat by Watford uh, in a playoff semi final, I think it was. And and um, Ian Dowie just left Crystal Palace, went to Charlton, and he tried to get me to go to Charlton. And probably my preferred choice was going to Charlton because it's still in London. I just had a young baby at the time. And Crystal Palace and Charlton didn't, you know, as rivals don't get, didn't get on, and he was never going to go and sell their Player of the Year to um, the the big one of the biggest rivals. So, you know, the, the it came along. Fitz Hall moved to Wigan and kept ringing me, ringing me, ringing me, ringing me, and say, "Look, Boise, come up here. You know, it's good up here, etc., etc." I'm like, "Nah." And then one day I went up there and it was sunny. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'm like, "Well, it's not as bad as I thought." And, uh, and then the transfer got done. I uh, spoke to Paul Jewell. He sold the club to me straight away. And the rest is history. And, you know, it's been the best decision I've ever, uh, you know, made in my career. Yeah. So the two points I want to know then about transfers, and obviously you don't have to go into too much detail. Um, transfer deadline day for a player. If you're not on the move, do you pay much attention to it? Do you care? Are you, are you one who sits on the city and watches? Or is it just one of the things that comes with football and you're not really that bothered? No, yeah, I think every footballer pays attention to it, especially you know, you know, watching Sky Sports and stuff like that. And you know, you know, as a as a player, you always see who's going to come in um, and who's going to leave, because obviously it's going to impact your season. You know, you know, we went for um, the time where we was at Wigan, we were seventh in the league, flying, and then we had to sell Emil Heskey, Palacios, Valencia in January, um, and that you know, for us, it knocked us completely off our off our track. Um, but yeah, as a player, you're always looking to see what players are going to come in, what, what players are going to go, and how it's going to affect your season. So, and then the interesting one is who else is going out, you know, other clubs, you know, because obviously we all support football clubs. So, we're always interested to see who's going to be on move and, and the surprising transfers that happen. So, my other, uh, my other question, and it's a real bone of contention in sport, particularly from fans. So, uh, if you see a young player getting moved away from your club who maybe have come through academy, this person always tends to get the blame and it's football agents. Um, and this could be a completely separate podcast, I feel, um, about football agents. I mean, what did, what were your experience? Did you have an agent? Um, do, do you see the benefit in them in football? or And do they get an unfair, bad rep? I think um, agents like any sort of industry. You know, you have good ones, you have bad ones. And I've had, I've had experience on both sides. You know, i got, you know, my first agent was a complete con artist, you know, in... You know, it was a big learning curve straight away. and um, But no, you do, you do have agents who are very good at their jobs um, that get you some good moves. And, and But ultimately, you know, I see it as agents are there to make money for themselves as well as, as well as the player. So that was always my thinking. You know, it was never a case of, uh, you know, he's getting that much money. Um, it's always a case that he's got a job to do. And I respect to that. As long as he does the best for, my, for me, then... He's going to do best for himself. That's just how life works, and that's how I looked at it, you know. And I think the other side of the agency now is, um, you know, the mental side of it. You know, it's not just a case of them just doing a deal now. They got to make sure that, you know, if I ever go into agency, I want to know I can mentor the player that I'm doing, you know, and you know, give them my experience. You know, make sure their guidelines, make sure they prepare themselves for after football as well as in football. And I think that's mm -hmm. the most important thing out of everything. 
Yeah, absolutely. So on to your time at Wigan then. I, I actually reached out to a couple of Wigan fans um, just, just to ask sort of, um, their opinion. And um, I think the word legend gets used quite a lot. Uh, but every single Wigan fan I asked described you as a legend. Um, and when I asked, I, I, dug, I dug a bit more and said, well, to tell me why. And it was, you know, 100% effort, um, you know, run through brick walls for you, scored some absolute screamers and made yeah. the best the best def de defensive block they've ever seen of all time. Can you remember which one we're talking about? Yeah, the, the defensive block was Dzeko. Um, that's probably my best game in my career. I was 34 at the time. The year before, we just won the FA Cup. And we played at Man City at the Etihad, and that meant to be the revenge game. It's on TV. You know, it was meant to be a fluke. The FA Cup final was a fluke. We had a new manager, a new team. And we went to Etihad. I think it was the quarterfinals of the FA Cup. And they meant to go and hammer us. And for me, it's my best game I ever had in my career. You know, and then the Dzeko ball came in. Um, someone crossed it, and he was in front of the goal, beat our goalkeeper, and it was just a last-ditch tackle. And it just managed to hit my big toe, and <laughs> went the bar. so it was a, you know, my big feet done good for that for that time. But ultimately, it, it saved us um, in the game, and we went on and you know beat him, and you know the rest is history. Yeah, absolutely. And I mean, you, you touched on a few players there. I mean, I think a few people forget now because obviously Wigan have, have uh, dropped back down the leagues now. But some some players in that Wigan team, you know, um, you've already mentioned uh, Emileski, uh, Valencia, who went on to have a, obviously a glittering career. Um, yourself, uh, Jimmy Bullard spent a bit of time there. Literally, like the, the the team of that era all went on to have you know incredibly successful careers. Um, so, what, what kind of what it like at Wigan? Who you know, no disrespect to Wigan, but they're not really known for a football town. It's rugby league, really. Um, you know, what what was your experience through your nine years at Wigan? And another thing that a couple of the fans said though, they were absolutely gutted that you didn't stay another year to get your um, testimonial. No, I think Dave Whelan owes a um, people owe a lot to Dave Whelan. Obviously, he he took the rugby side and you know made rugby very very you know successful, and then he he took on the football side, and you know his passion, his drive. You know when I first spoke to him, he's like his passion. He just said, as long as you give a hundred percent, that's all he cares about. You know, and everything else will fall in place. Um, no, regarding myself, you know, I spent nine years there. I left in a, in a bad way. Um, you know, I was you know, at the time I left, I was I was very hurt. You know, they didn't give me a, an extra contract. You know, it wasn't a case where they didn't give it to me. It was how it went about. You know, they basically just literally just let me go out the back door. No one said anything to me, and it was only in the summer somebody rang me and asked, you know, what I'm doing. That I actually found out that I wouldn't get another contract. So you know, and that's and that's the most disappointing thing about my whole time at Wigan is how it left. And I was ne I vowed never step back in Wigan. You know. You know, that was it. And I remember, you know, obviously Dave Wheeling, but it was the Wigan fans. They put on This Is Your Life For Me, you know, made a massive tribute um, for me. And, and that was the, the most touching moment ever, you know. And, and that was um, the hurt of leaving Wigan, um, the way it was. And then the fans just, uh, came out in force and, you know, gave me that. And I remember going back to Wigan as a, a Blackpool player. And I came on and the whole ground just stood up and clapped and, you know, I'm not an emotional guy, as people probably say, but, you know, that brought a tear to my eye. And, it, it, you know, that brought me back to Wigan in terms of, you know, my love I had for him because purely because of the fans. Yeah, absolutely. Obviously, loads of accolades in that time at Wigan, but there's one, and I'm sure you know which one we're going to talk about, that I want to focus on. So as a boy, me growing up, we used to play a game called Wembley, and it was all designed, you got through to this uh, invented FA Cup final. But certainly for me as a kid, uh, being the ripe old age of 35 now, um, the FA Cup was the footballing pinnacle at that time for me. So can you just talk us through what it was like that day as an experience, uh, not only to get to the FA Cup final, but to beat Man City or an absolute juggernaut at the time and then captain them that day and lift the trophy? Yeah, it was, um, it's a strange experience. You know, you know, we went into the, the Cup final knowing we had a game on Tuesday, which was more important <laughs> than ever, ever made sense. We had to beat Arsenal at the... Emirates uh, at the yeah at the Emirates to stay up in the Premier League, so we went into the Cup final against Man City with our minds on the Arsenal game rather than actually the City game. So we played Man City two weeks before, three weeks before, and they scored in the last couple of minutes to beat us, and we came off that pitch disappointed. <clears throat> so we went into the Cup final already confident that we could we could beat them. 
but not not so much beaten, but we could give him a good game. And I remember Martinez said to us, you know, before the game, you know, just make sure that we do ourselves justice. He goes, as long as we keep the ball, pass it, you know, we'll cause an upset here. You've got to believe it. And then Dave Wheeling came in change rooms and, you know, around Wigan, there's a famous story about him breaking his leg and he always talks about it and that's always his ghost that, you know, he can't get off, the monkey on his back, he can't go. And he just told us, you know, enjoy this game because, you know, football goes so quickly. So for me, you know, going into that cup final, you know, when all these positive thoughts, all this momentum going through us, and it was like a free hit. And I remember picking up Joseph, um, you know, he was our lucky mascot, you know, the boy that I held in the cup final. Um, you know, Joseph, you know, I didn't even know he had Joseph go on his back. I just wanted to, you know, I was meant to push him out. And I said, can I carry him? Because, you know, he's one of us and, you know, I prefer to carry him rather than push him in the wheelchair. And from, he calmed me down. You know, there was no nerves whatsoever. I came out on the pitch, you know, thousands and thousands of fans there. I think it was like 90,000 fans that were there. Sea of blue. And the cup final just went to plan. You know, Martinez was a genius forward-thinking manager who tactically outdone Man City on that day. And um, his philosophy was to keep the ball, switch a play, counter-attack. And Matt Manuman had a, a magnificent, magnificent game. And obviously, as the game went on, um, you know, Zablet got sent off. You know, and then Ben Watson came up with, a, with that winning goal. And for him, was a, a fairy tale because he broke his leg early in that season and then came on the sub, scored a winning goal. You know, the stuff that dreams are made of. And then, on a personal note, you know, standing at that, standing in the front of the queue to go up to those that that special Wembley steps to lift up the FA Cup. As you said, you know, as a boy, you know, I please playing at Alfred Rose Park in Aylesbury. You know, put our tops down for goals, and then. Um, you know, always imagine that you're going to score that winning goal, lifting up the trophy, celebrating. And it was like a, a flashback for me. I had to take a second to think, you know, this is what I was doing as a boy, dreaming about it. And now this opportunity, walk up those steps. My family's in the crowd. You know, the Wigan fans are going you know, crazy. And to actually get your hands on that cup and lift it, you know, it was like a, everything just stood still. It was like a magical, magical moment. Yeah, and I think um, everybody loves a good underdog story. And um, as as a neutral, I, I was a Wigan fan for the day, just because that is that is the beauty of the FA Cup. The underdog story is, is always the beauty of the FA Cup. I now I I personally think, and it's controversial, but I personally think the FA Cup's been devalued over the years, and I don't think it's held in such esteem as it should be anymore. Um, but I always love the early rounds, the you know the um, the, the, the sort of blood and thunder of the non-league clubs who, you know, they've got a, I don't know, a plaster or a milkman who's who's playing at full back or whatever. And I always kind of love that. And when you guys got to the FA Cup final and then went on to beat City, I, I, it's just one of them great FA Cup stories. And for me, why the FA Cup is, is so fantastic. Um, do you ever watch it back <laughs> just to reminisce? I, no, I saw it a couple of um, a weeks ago. It was on, on TV and... My son's got a DVD of it, and it's, it's one of them, you know, as the years go by, the more you appreciate it, the more you realise how special it was. You know, at the time, you win it, and it's like, it's fantastic, but, you know, in, you're in a football bubble, so you don't really appreciate it. And then a year go by, then two years go by, then three years go by, and now, you know, it's seven years gone by. <laughs> and you're like, you know, you look back and thinking, it was only yesterday. <laughs> but, yeah. um, you know, for me, you know, a special moment that you can always talk about in your career. People, it's funny enough, people always relate me to the FA Cup rather than actually my Premier League playing career. <laughs> you know, and, and that's a special moment about the Cup. And I think if you talk to players-wise, you know, everybody wants to go far in the FA Cup. You know, when I was at Luton, you always looked to draw a big club. You know, you wanted to play against the Man Knights, the Arsenals, the Liverpools, you know, because when I was playing League One, I never ever thought I could get into the Premier League. You know, because it looked like so massive difference. And then suddenly, you know, you get a massive draw and you're playing at these... I think my first game was against Cholton, you know, in the, in the, in the FA Cup. And now they were Premier League tied at the time. And the buzz that you, you generated for the FA Cup and you thought, right, I want to play in the Premier League. And that's your determination to get there. Yeah, absolutely. So, obviously, after Wigan and you went on to, to feature in the Europa League um, after they won the FA Cup... Um, a move, a move to Black, uh, Blackpool, you've already mentioned that um, it didn't end great for you at Wigan or not how you'd wanted it to end. Um, what, what were you like moving to, from Wigan to Blackpool? Um, 
it was a shock. <laughs> Put it that way. It's um, Luton is a family club. Uh, Crystal Palace is a family club. Wigan is a family club. And then suddenly I stepped in at Blackpool. Um, Neil McDonald was the manager at the time, and he's my. It was my coach at Crystal Palace. And he gave me a ring. Said, "Look, do you want to come down?" I'm like, "Do you know what? It's close to home. So I live in. I uh, live in the northwest. So yeah, no problem." And I remember the first game. You know, got there first game. It was a home game. And our fans were booing us, you know. And I'm, I'm looking around thinking, hold on, <laughs> you know what I mean? I'm thinking, I'm sure I'm, oh, we're playing at home. And our fans are booing us and obviously the chairman at the time. And, you know, we had a lot of like first year pros that, you know, there was their first year experience in, the, in football and you got your own fans booing you. And it was, not a, it was not a pleasant place to be. And it was an amazing, major shock for me, you know, as a player. 30, I think I was 35 at the time. Never experienced it ever, you know, in my whole career. And, you know, it, it was one of them. Got to, you know, got halfway through the season, I realised, you know, it wasn't for me. Mm. So, at what point then, Emerson, as a, you know, high-level athlete who's played at the top of the game, who's, you know, had an absolute multitude of Premier League appearances, uh, represented your country internationally, all that, at what point do you think, do you know what, I think now might be the time to hang the boots up? Um, I think there's it's a lot of factors, you know, you know, people said I should have carried on. Um, I had a lot of personal issues at the time. Um, I was at a club that, you know, I didn't feel, you know, it felt more problems than, than, than anything else. Um, and it wasn't, you know, I, I lost the love of the game, you know, to put it, to put it bluntly, I lost the love of the game and it was nothing motivating me. You know, I look back at it now, I should have helped the youngsters a bit more. But I was going for my own personal troubles and <clears throat> I got into the coming to training, I wasn't happy. You know, I wasn't enjoying it. You know, coming to a Saturday, you know, I wasn't enjoying it as much as I should have been. So I got to the stage, I spoke to the manager, said, look, you know, you know, you know, it's not for me no more. I don't think I can, you know, perform 100 percent And he was very understanding and you know, we had young players coming through anyway. And he just said, look, just give your experience to younger players that are coming through and guide them to the end of the season. And then obviously when it comes to the end of the season, decide what you want to do. And and that's what it is. I, I decided to walk away from football. Um, as I say, the, the transition side of it, I, I found a bit difficult. But as I say, a lot of people don't understand people going through personal problems. So that made that had a major impact on me in terms of hanging up my boots. So, but I still go down and I play with my brothers now, you know, play five aside and, you know, that buzz I get back is, you know, you can't replace it. And, and that's the biggest thing I miss out of all of it. It's the biggest buzz playing in front of thousands and thousands of people. And this enjoyment of playing football. Yeah, I mean, we all, no matter what level you play at, um, whether it's in a park, kind of Sunday with your pals, or whether it's, you know, the level you play, the very top level of football, we all play for the love of the game ultimately, don't we? That's, you know, we all fell in love with football first and foremost before anything else. Um and yeah, I, I I totally agree with that. You still need to kind of keep some of that. I mean, I'm uh, absolutely football balmy. Have been all my life. I'm never lucky enough to play at any particularly decent level. But I did that foolish thing not so long ago where I haven't played apart from the odd charity game uh, for a while, and I turned out uh, for the over 35s on my 35th birthday <laughs> and taught taught me ACL. Yeah, for real? Oh no way! <laughs> Playing it right back, jumped for a header, landed funny, taught me wow. ACL. So, yeah. podcasting about football is my still link to football because yeah. the boots are hung up because the wife won't let me get them back out. Yeah. Right. I'm really honest. Yeah, um, <laughs> yeah but uh, moving on then. Uh, so, I've, I've, I've noticed a theme running through this podcast, uh, Emerson, with yourself, that uh, you are a very um, humble guy, very giving guy. And was sort of youth coaching and setting up the Emerson Boyce Academy a natural fit for you because of the way you are as a person? Yeah, I think, um, not just me, I think a lot of footballers, retired players want to give something back. And it's not always um, an easy opportunity for them to get back into involved with football. Um, you know, I went into an academy and, you know, yeah, it was, it was all right. But, you know, you know, for me, you know, without being too harsh, you know, it's, they're taught a certain way, but it's not always the way that they're going to get into the, you know, the top level. You know, and you know, I was on debate on an, another show, and we were talking about Ronaldo and Messi, and you know, Ronaldo is a perfect foil of a player where Messi, you know, doesn't really use his left, his right foot. 
small, etc., etc. And I relate to myself where, you know, throughout my whole career, I don't think I use my left foot, <laughs> you know, and, you know, it doesn't always come to technique. It also comes to being guided the right way, the right uh, advice. And for me, I just want to give something back to the youngsters. Um, I'm looking to set up an academy in the Northwest. Uh, I'm still doing things in Barbados. And I think it's, you know, a great opportunity for me and for other players that retired to give something back to the, the younger generation, which, you know, over the years has been lost for me anyway. And, um, you know, if I can help, in, you know, to, to help, simple advice, you know, I remember coming, you know, growing up with simple people's advice that, you know, led me on to my career. And I think so many players have got so much to offer that's not got, uh, got opportunity to do it. And that's what I'm trying to do as well, bring the older players back to keep, to coaching the academy to, you know, give their own experience and own, own knowledge because knowledge is power, <laughs> you know, and, you know, and that's how I think it is. No, you're, you're absolutely right. I mean, um, after my son got released by Leeds, I ended up coaching his team, uh, just a local team, and I went and did my um, FA coaching course and things like that so that I could all be all sort of... All signed up and all, all singing, all dancing kind of thing. And um, with 25 years of watching football and thinking I understood football and all that type of stuff behind it, uh, I couldn't help but feel but come away from the coaching course that I don't think the coaching course is designed in the best way to set up players, if that makes any sense. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I felt it focused too much on trying to round off and make every player be able to kick it with both feet, head it, chest it, control it. And there was far too much emphasis on kids not being able to do that rather than kids just going and enjoying it. Whether it comes off the shin, off the knee, okay. whatever, they think they've scored their, their winning goal in their FA Cup final. It, feel, it felt to me like there weren't enough emphasis on that and there was far too much emphasis on trying to create the next Wayne Rooney that then clubs mm -hmm. can come and sort of trawl a net and take them away and try and... But then, like, this is a bigger debate because then it, it leads parents into a false sense of security as well. That they believe that, you know, little Johnny at home is is the next Wayne Rooney who's going to buy him their house for the next 30 yeah. years or whatever. And, yeah, I, you know, I, um, I came out of youth coaching just through frustration more than anything because um, I just don't think it's set up particularly right in, in my eyes. But, you know, who am I to... Uh, well, yeah, um, it's, a, it's a hard one because, um, you know, everybody's got their own philosophy and, and where they see the game being played. Um, I think um, the, I think the FA's put a manual down, you know, to guide people through. Um, I think once you've got your own confidence enough and you've got your own philosophy, then it's how you want to implement it in the way that you want to implement it. Um, you know, for me, you know, as I say, you know, I wasn't, I wasn't technically, I wasn't the best. But I believe in hard work, you know, giving everything and and making do with the best talent. So I can I can see how you know a lot of coaches go down the route of you know you've got our, and as I said, Cristiano Ronaldo is the perfect model that people are likely to base their coaching on. Where you know you go to the other side of it, look at Messi, you know he does everything what he what he's capable of doing to the best, <laughs> you know, and and that's if he's just one footed really, he needs the left foot. He maximises it. So, you know, my message probably is, you know, yes, round them off as much as you can, but if they've got potential to be, you know, with their left foot, work on it, you know, maximising their potential of, of making that great, you know, and everything else good. And as I said, you know, with me, I never used my left foot, but I played in the Premier League for eight years. <laughs> so, you know, so it goes to show, you know, you, know, you don't have to be perfect, but as long as you're good at most things, then you can get through yeah, absolutely. Um, Rhett Emerson, we kind of get into the point of rounding up, but I've got some fan questions for you first. Yeah. Uh, so we've just got the two. So from Trev Fowler, who, uh, again, was one of the fans who uh, named you as a Luton Town legend. Sure. Uh, what's the worst dressing room you've been to? He put, I know Luton's is pretty ropey, but we'll exclude <laughs> that choice. I'm about to say that's from a Luton fan. <laughs> but um, no, uh, for me, it's probably Grinsby. Grinsby away on Tuesday night, cold. Uh, it was yeah, it was not the best, and in them days, I'm sure people used to talk the uh, you know the heating and stuff like that. So imagine Tuesday night in December, cold near that sea. Yeah, you know, oh, it was awful. It was awful, and the showers used to be cold as well. <laughs> Just to oh, round it off. <laughs> yeah, on purpose, no doubt as well. Exactly. So you lost the game. You're in cold change rooms. Then you got to have a cold shower. Then you get on the bus on the way back home. So <laughs> yeah, it wasn't the best. <laughs> 
Yeah, and the uh, next question is from Grace Fuller97 over on Twitter. And um, their question is a uh, Luton themed again. Uh, your best moment in a Luton shirt? Um, promotion. We got promotion one year. Um, um, that's probably got me best. Uh, obviously, scoring my first goal. Um, and then, um, well, making my debut. You know, making my debut, you know, as a kid, coming onto that pitch in front of fans is always going to be special. And, you know, that's got to be one of my highlights of my career at Luton. And then I've got a couple for you, Emerson, and they are very cliche, as you often get in these interviews. Uh, so I've got to get them in there. Uh, best player you played against? So I've been, I've been lucky enough to play against some magnificent players, you know, from Giggs to Jogba, Lampard, Gerard, Suarez, Torres. Um, but one stands out for me is um, Thierry Henry. You know, what a player. You know, that's all I've got to say. You know, I played against Ronaldo and Bale as well, but Henri just had that something about him. Just made it, just made the game look so easy. You know, and it was always hard to play against. And I say, say I was played right back most of the time. So he was always drifting on that, on that on my side and to cut inside. So, you know, for me, Terry Henri was probably the hardest player to play against. Yeah, and when I get asked occasionally who's the best player I've seen at Ellen Road, he is the same uh, mm. same name as well. Because uh, I watched him come to Ellen Road with Arsenal um, and he was absolutely incredible to the point where um, I stopped watching the game and just watched him. Just, just watched him, yeah. Like, wow, yeah, just like... like you well, know. was me on the pitch. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, best player you played with? Uh, with um, Valencia. He went on to have a magnificent career at Man United. Uh, Emma Heskey was so underrated as a as a player. You know, he was a, literally a beast both sides. You know, um, in Zobia Palacios. You know, I've been lucky enough to play at Wigan, where you had so many players coming through and went on to play bigger. You know, for better teams. So, for me, probably Valencia Palacios. You know, probably probably the best. Uh, last two then. Um, ground you love playing at, and ground you hated playing at. The ground I loved playing at was at Emirates, you know, at Highbury. I that was the Highbury before because I'm an Arsenal fan. And to play at Highbury um, in 2004, I think it was 2004, you know, was um, for me, you know, special. You know, playing against them players, going through that tunnel, that tight, tight tunnel. And then stepping on that uh, magical pitch, you know, it was, you know, for me it was um, a special moment. The worst ground, I think Lincoln, Lincoln away. You know, you get the wind that's coming through. Grinsby or Lincoln, and even Stoke, because <laughs> Stoke's chucked Stoke in there as well. But I think Lincoln away, just got that wind that's coming through the pitch. This used to be awful. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. And one, another one for me, being a being a Leeds fan, I've got to ask this. What What's it like playing at Ellen Road as an opposition player? Because us, us Leeds fans have got a skewed perception that we're the best fans in the world, we make the best atmosphere. So I just, I just want to get your take on it uh, as an opposition player at Ellen Road. It's funny enough, cause I played. I played um, the first one I played at Ellen Road was the FA Cup Youth Semi Final, um, when that Leeds team went on. You know, with, with Woodgate, Hart, Smith, Roberts, uh, Roberts, Robertson, um, and that, it was an empty stadium. But the, the, that far stand was was you know so big. You know what I mean? It's like it was massive. And then I was lucky enough to play as a player, and the fans were were fantastic. You know, the atmosphere they create. You know, it's one of the, one of the stadiums that you, you like playing at because it was always, you know, that atmosphere was always an extra buzz. For the home team, it must be fantastic to play for. But, for, you know, for a away team, it was always a little bit intimidating. And, you know, but you like playing at the ground because the atmosphere was so good. Yeah, absolutely. So to kind of round us up then, Emerson, uh, where can we find you now? You know, what are you up to now? T tell us a little bit about your academy. Yeah, I'm hoping, obviously, you know, we have got to follow the government guidelines this minute in time, you know, keep safe, distance, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and we're looking to set up the academy, you know, whether it's in Wigan, Ultram or, or Warrington. Um, uh, we're looking to do it in that sort of area at the moment, just trying to finalise the last couple of things. And then hopefully come September when this is out of the way, we can, you know, start kicking on and, and, and you know, producing some the next generation of talented players. Um, I'm also trying to do something in Barbados, same sort of thing. Um, obviously, you know, pay for Barbados and my family are from there. So, you know, to give back to the community, the country, you know, we're trying to develop some players over there to, you know, show the talent they've got in Barbados, in Europe and in the rest of the world. So, they're the two I'm doing at the moment. So, fingers crossed, you see the next generation players coming through there in St. Boys Academy. 
Absolutely. Uh, and where can people find you, mate, on social media and stuff like that, assuming that you do use it? Yeah, Instagram. Um, that's my name. Instagram, the main one. Uh, LinkedIn, Facebook. Um, that's my name, Emerson Boyce. I'll be on there. May not be the best to follow, but hey. <laughs> we live in that world where social media is everything now, isn't it? Um, yeah, that's actually, yeah. 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 Uh, Emerson, it has been an absolute honour and a privilege to interview you. Uh, I've, I've really, really enjoyed it. I hope you have too. Um, that brings us to an end of this bonus episode, uh, episode five. Uh, a big thanks to you, Emerson, for taking your time out um, uh, during lockdown and stuff. And, um, you know, keep yourself safe. Good luck with the academy. Uh, I'll, I'll be I'll be keeping an eye on it and seeing how it's going from a, from afar. Uh, a big thanks to everybody who's tuned in. Make sure you like and share, subscribe, tell people about the podcast. Big thanks to the guys from the Terrace. Uh, and, and that's it. So thanks again, Emerson. Thank you very much, pal. And, thanks uh, a lot. Keep safe. You as well, mate. I'll see you soon. All right.